All right, this is Mr. Peterson with another screencast for AP Environmental Science. Today, we're going to be learning about food as it relates to the human population. So, is the idea of food security. Food security describes a condition where every person in an area has daily access to enough nutritious food to live a healthy and active life. There's more than enough food on Earth to feed everyone, but about 16% of the people on Earth live in a state of food insecurity. That's where they live with chronic hunger and poor nutrition. There are many obstacles in the way to achieving food security, but the number one problem is poverty. Simply not having enough money to buy food or buy the seeds and equipment needed to grow their own food keeps a large number of people in a state of food insecurity. Anything that interrupts the regular deliver the regular delivery of food, like a political upheaval, corruption, and war, can also cause food insecurity. Next up is a pair of very confusing words. First is undernutrition which is the condition of not having enough food to eat to even meet basic energy needs. I put up the picture of this tiniest amount of food I could find simply because the picture I could put up here of actual people suffering from undernutrition are just too shocking for me to display here. People suffering from undernutrition can have stunted growth or if it is severe enough, usually die of conditions like diarrhea and disease that are easy for a healthy person to survive. They generally have a lower life expectancy, greater susceptibility to illness and disease, and lower productivity and life quality. Now, on the other hand, we have malnutrition, where people have rec may receive enough food to meet their energy needs, but is severely lacking one more key nutrient, like protein, iron, vitamin A, or iodine. This child suffers from a condition called protein deficiency syndrome. It looks like he's receiving enough to eat because he has a big round belly, but in truth, he's malnourished. Because of the near total lack of protein in his diet, the fluids in his blood have changed composition and the plasma of his blood leaks into his tissues faster than the lymphatic system can drain it out. As a result of that and his lack of muscle from eating a protein deficient diet, his abdomen swells outward as fluids fill it up and his abdominal wall muscles are too weak to push it back in. This woman shows a very noticeable condition called goiter, which is a swollen thyroid gland. Normally, the thyroid gland is a small organ that sits at the front of your neck, and it produces hormones that help regulate your metabolism. For it to function normally, it requires small amounts of the element iodine from the food you eat. Lack of iodine can prevent proper thyroid function, which results in stunted growth, mental disability, and swollen thyroid, as seen here. Iodine is found in lots of foods naturally, but in areas of the world that don't have much iodine in the soil, this condition is quite common. In the U.S. and other industrialized countries, you can thank this for preventing goiter. Iodized salt is just regular salt with a very small amount of iodine in it. You know, everyone puts salt on their food, so you get a small dose of iodine with every shake. Another key nutrient is vitamin A. Vitamin A is required for many normal body processes, and severe lack of vitamin A in childhood can cause blindness. Nearly half a million children under age six go blind each year for this reason. More than half of them die within the next year. This brings up the golden rice case study. Daffodils are a flower that is rich in beta carotene, so researchers took genes from the flowers and inserted them into rice DNA. That's a real application of using the genetic diversity of the world around us to try to improve things. The resulting rice that grows has a golden color due to the increased amount of beta carotene in it. Kids who eat the rice get the beta carotene in their diet every day. Now, there's a whole set of issues that come up with genetic, genetically modified food, but we're not going to get into those today. Now, moving on to famine, that's when there is a severe shortage of food in an area, along with mass starvation, death, and economic and social chaos. Famine can be caused by war, drought, flooding, or many other catastrophes. On the completely opposite side of hunger, we have the condition of overnutrition. This is the infamous KFC double down sandwich served Luther style with a Krispy Kreme donut for the bun. People who are overfed and overweight suffer similar health problems as those who are starving, though lower life expectancy, greater susceptibility to illness and disease, and lower productivity and quality of life. We definitely have people who are in poverty in the U.S. and starving, but overnutrition is more of a problem in the U.S. And a food culture like this definitely isn't helping. Now, as to how food is produced, we can 
group it into three main categories. First up, grains like wheat, corn, and rice make up 77% of the world's food. Meat, like beef and chicken, account for about 16% of the world's food. Overgrazing can cause desertification, which can push regions toward being increasingly arid until they become deserts, increasing food scarcity. Methods of meat production include concentrated animal feeding operations, known as CAFOs, or feedlots, like the one seen here. If everyone on Earth would eat less meat, we could reduce CO2, methane, and nitrogen emissions, conserve water, reduce the use of antibiotics and growth hormones, and improve topsoil. Meat production is less efficient than agriculture. It takes, up, it takes approximately 20 times more land to produce the same amount of calories from meat as from plants. And fisheries produce about 7% of the world's food. Technically, fish is meat, but it's so different from beef and chicken that it just gets counted differently. Overfishing has led to the extreme scarcity of some fish, which lessens biodiversity. Much of the increase in recent food production come from the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution came in the 1960s through the introduction of specifically selected high yield crop varieties, along with industrialized agriculture that uses lots of equipment, fertilizer, pesticides, and water to produce large amounts of crop. This production increase can be a positive thing for profits and efficiency for farms, but it can also increase reliance on fossil fuels. Many new crop varieties have been introduced over time, and although this zorse, or a cross between a horse and a zebra, isn't really intended for eating, I put it to show the effects of crossbreeding to produce new varieties. Oftentimes, two closely related species will be bred with each other in an effort to take the positive characteristics of the two different species and combine them into one organism. Many times, it's a complete failure, but it takes, but all it takes is one success in order to make a new variety of livestock, fish, or crop plant. Artificial selection can produce new varieties of over time. Now, I hope nobody is eating dogs, but I put them in here to illustrate a point about artificial selection. These dogs are all members of the same species, but they've all been through the process of artificial, artificial selection, which is what gives each breed its particular characteristics. Strawberries like this one are the result of many years of artificial selection, where the only plants that were allowed to produce the next generation were the ones with the largest fruit. Repeat several hundred times and you take the original plant with the fruit size of a pencil eraser and increase it to the size of, well, seen here. In more recent times, genetic engineering has taken the step one step further by adding genes from a completely different organism into the DNA of a crop. These genes can improve the quality of the food in many different ways, like making it slower to rot or making it more nutritious. But many people have reservations about genetically modified food. For example, the gene from a fish being inserted into a strawberry plant means that the strawberries are sweeter and stay fresh longer. That's good. However, if you're allergic to fish, can you eat strawberries? not exactly something you think of when you're picking food off of a fruit tray. Also, what if you're a vegetarian? Can you still eat strawberry? Increases in meat production have largely come from the use of feedlots, like this one, where animals are kept together and fed grain that was grown out of pastures and rangelands that have, were converted to cropland. Grazing livestock on grass to raise them to slaughter weight is a slow process, but Feeding them corn and other grains can accelerate the process and produce more meat in a shorter time. But it has its downsides. More grain has to be grown for this purpose, and because of the second law of thermodynamics, the amount of energy in the grain going into these kinds of operations doesn't come back out in the same amount of meat energy when the livestock is slaughtered. If you look at the grain and used it to feed people, that grain would go a lot further. One more thing. There are some serious air and water pollution issues here. Think about how it probably smells in this picture, and you'll realize that these operations have to manage the waste produced by these cows, lest they escape to pollute the water supply nearby. Another increase in food production has come from aquaculture, or fish farming. This is an inland farm where fish are raised in pools. Sometimes they are simply fenced in areas along the coastline. There has been a massive global increase in the use of aquaculture as wild fish stocks are decreasing. Now, Fisheries are something different. 
Fisheries are concentrations of commercially suitable fish in a natural body of water. There has been an increase in the amount of fish caught there due to increased technology and equipment, but many decreases are starting to happen due to overfishing. Agricultural practices that can cause environmental damage include things like tilling, slash and burn farming, seen here, and the use of fertilizers. Now, as the environmental problems that can result from food production, they fall into five categories. The first is effects on the soil, like this soil erosion. It's not hard to imagine that just a few years ago, this was a small stream flowing through the field, but due to poor farming practices, the soil has eroded away. Looking in the picture, this can be hard to reverse because what's left behind now is the light orange areas is the hard subsoil, which while it's mineral rich, it's not the topsoil that plants need in order to grow. Soil erosion can have effects on the water quality of areas downstream, which was another big environmental problem on this list. The certification is another soil effect. Areas of the world that are already quite dry normally can naturally convert other over to deserts during long periods of drought. Food production increases the effect because as natural vegetation is cleared to make room for crops or livestock, the new vegetation isn't as capable of surviving a drought. When you think about it in long term and realize that rainfall comes in part from water loss from vegetation, and you've cut down the plants that were a natural part of this cycle, then it comes becomes clear why normal land can convert over to deserts in a short period of time. Another soil effect is salination. Water used for irrigation naturally contains very low amounts of salt that it, in, it picked up flowing over rocks and soil. If the water isn't absorbed into the plants and allowed to soak deeply into the soil, much of the irrigated water evaporates, leaving the salt behind. Repeat that process many times and the soil becomes saltier, which hurts plant growth. It's different if the water soaks into the soil. That dilutes the salt, so there isn't as much of an issue. There's a parallel here to ancient conflicts where when one army wanted to add insult to injury after defeat in battle, they would salt the fields by spreading salt into the cropland to make it harder to grow food. Next up is energy use. This one ties into effects on water, air pollution, and human health, simply because of the shocking amount of energy that's used to produce and transport food. Up to 70% of the 17% of the energy used by industry in this country is related to food production and transportation. That energy has to be generated for power plants, which add to water and air pollution. Now, human health can also be affected, and one example is the rise of genetically modified food. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but here we are. This picture is a bit dramatic, but the truth of the matter is that the long-term effects of genetically modified food simply are not known. If a person is deathly allergic to fish, will it be safe for them to eat a tortilla chip made with corn that had fish genes inserted into it? Right now, it's hard to tell. A little more realistically, there are many effects on human health from all of the chemicals used in food production either through consumption of those chemicals when the food is eaten or when the chemicals run off into the water supply and are consumed. Lastly, food production has many effects on biodiversity. The obvious ones are as land gets cleared to produce more food, the local biodiversity suffers due to habitat loss. But as agriculture becomes more industrialized, the biodiversity of the food we grow itself becomes smaller and smaller. As an example, there were over 200 varieties of apples as recently as 100 years ago. Now, most com commercial production of apples involves fewer than 15 varieties. That's great from the efficiency side, as all equipment can be standardized for a small number of varieties. Boxes can be standardized, and the list goes on. But it's horrible from the perspective of what happens if there's a disease or pest that all of those apples varieties are susceptible to. It's not a guarantee, but there's a better chance that one of those original 200 varieties would be resistant to whatever challenge the future brings. That's true for all crop varieties. As we focus on increasing production by standardizing everything, we put ourselves at awful risk when over 90% of the food we eat globally comes from around 30 varieties of plants and animals. Now, I won't lie, I like to eat. And I'll thank every farmer and rancher I ever met because I like to eat. The question is, how can we do it sustainably? The first area of concern is pest control. Pests are any species that interfere with humans by competing with us for food, spreading disease, or simply being a nuisance. This is the European corn borer, which damages corn stalks. Pests normally aren't a problem in natural environments because natural controls keep them in check. In nature, if a species consume all of one plant, 
they aren't going to spread easily because the next plant of that species is not growing right next to the previous one. In nature, if a species becomes too numerous, there's likely to be a predator species out there somewhere that will quickly make a meal out of that. Now abundant prey. Agricultural removes those natural checks and balances because when crops are planted all together in a field, that's like an unlimited food supply for the pests. Plus, the natural predators may not be present to keep them in check. Because those natural controls have often been removed, pesticides are used to control populations of organisms that we consider to be undesirable. This can help farmers produce more food, but there are downsides. Many pest species have developed genetic resistance to some pesticides. Many pest species are R-selected, which means they reproduce rapidly and in large number. So there's always a chance that one of those organisms will have a natural resistance that it can spread as the population grows. Spraying for one pest species can kill off other natural predators like spiders and ladybugs, or the honeybee we discussed earlier, which can result in an explosion of second pest species weeks or months later. Plus, air, water, and food pollution is always an issue with pesticides. There are many alternatives to pesticides. The tomato plant on the right has had a few genes inserted into its DNA that makes it resistant to caterpillars. Grown in the same area as the plant on the left, it suffered much, much less from caterpillar damage. Natural predators are also a way to control pests. Bringing in exotic species from far off places to try to control pests is a pretty terrible idea, but there's nothing wrong with raising native predator species and releasing them into areas that happen to be full of their favorite food. This is a parasitic wasp that is laying eggs into the caterpillar. As the eggs grow, the larvae will kill the caterpillar and become wasps that will repeat the process again. Another pesticide alternative, well, sort of, is integrated pest management, or IPM. IPM uses biological, physical, limited chemical methods, intercropping, crop rotation, and natural predators of pests to help control pest species while minimizing the disruption to the environment. This can then reduce the risk that pesticides pose to wildlife, water supplies, and human health. This form of pest management minimizes disruptions in the environment and threats to human health, but can be complicated and expensive. IPM involves the use of pesticides, but only as a last resort. This boll weevil trap contains a disc soaked in a chemical that resembles a female boll weevil pheromone. Any boll weevil that is in the field may be attracted to it and trapped inside. People check the traps on a regular basis, and if there are no weevils present, there's no need to spray that field. If a farmer has 20 fields and only one has weevils showing up, then that field will be sprayed, and chances are the ones nearby too, just to be safe. But the majority of the ones that are clear don't need spraying. So that's sort of an alternative to pesticides because you're reducing the need for them while still recognizing that farms have to make a living and that world needs what food and other products they are growing. Now reaching back to the beginning of with the idea of food security, that comes from producing enough food to feed everyone every day, but it also involves making sure people have access to food. One way that can be achieved is through government control of food prices. It can work two ways. One is that government can regulate the price of a particular food to make sure that consumers can afford it. They may give subsidies to farmers to grow that food to make up for the loss of profit through food sale. They, also, they may also control prices by buying up large quantities of excess food production. The Federal School Lunch Program is a major benefactor of that as the US government regularly agrees to buy large amounts of extra beef, milk, cheese, and grains that go far beyond what the marketplace could purchase. If the government didn't buy up the surplus, then the prices of those items might drop, which would be great for consumers, but terrible for farmers. The program helps keep farmers in business by guaranteeing a minimum price for those goods. If we all agree that food security is a good thing, the government has a role to play here to make sure that the food producers stay in business. I like not paying taxes, and I don't want to pay any tax. I don't have to, but I like eating and being able to afford it. Food security can also be achieved by preventing poverty. This can be through education of women in areas with high poverty or simply better, better medical care. This kid may not want the immunization in that shot, but simply getting the immunization sets him up for a healthier life. And if you're sick less, you work more. And I think you can figure out what that does to poverty rates.
Last up are a few ideas of how to produce food more sustainably. Remember, the environment, envi remember that environmental science isn't all about that's bad, you shouldn't do that because it's killing the earth, blah, blah, blah. It's about finding ways to make sure you keep doing what you're doing forever. Number one on the list is soil conservation. Soil erosion is a big problem all around the world, especially on land that is anything but flat. This rice plantation is using terracy, where each small field is a flat section of a very steep hillside. So soil erosion is minimized because water can't flow very quickly down the hill. Another technique is contour plowing. The farmer who planted this wasn't just making, trying to make something interesting to look at. He was following the natural rise and fall of the hills to guide the direction of the rows he planted. If the rows all pointed directly downhill, the rainfall and irrigated water would get started in a row and rapidly accelerate downhill and cause soil erosion. Contour plowing puts all of the rows perpendicular to downhill, so water is slow as it flows and thereby causes less soil erosion. Plus, well, it's pretty. It may be a pain to drive the tractor that way, but it beats losing all your topsoil. The goal of soil conservation is to prevent soil erosion. Some strategies to improve soil fertility include crop rotation and the addition of green mature limestone. Now, I'm not 100% on what's being grown here, but I'd like a guess that the taller plants are corn. Planting them in strips with something else in between is part of protecting soil fertility. Crop rotation can protect soil fertility by changing what grows in a particular piece of ground from season to season and from year to year. If we came back and visited the scene a year later, this farmer may still be growing corn, but it may have switched locations to be growing in the strips that aren't filled with the corn this year. Believe it or not, that can dramatically cut down the insect damage, as many of those corn borers from before can overwinter in the crop residue left in the field after harvest. If you replant the same rows in the next year, the borers have an easy time finding food. If you plant just a few feet away from where you did last year, more of the borers will die before they can find food in the spring and summer. And that's a good thing. And this can all be part of integrated pest management. Aquaculture that takes place on land or along the coast faces a lot of challenges from the water pollution they produce. A lot of fish crammed into a small pen make just as much waste as chickens, pigs, or cows do. And it smells just about as bad. Open sea aquaculture involves floating pens like these where fish are raised inside and fed, but it's done out in the open water. There's a saying about pollution that you should know. It goes like this. Dilution is oftentimes the solution to many kinds of pollution. It's not the fish waste that's the problem, really. It's the concentration of it in a small place. So the natural decomposers can't process all of it at one time. Putting these fish farms out in the open ocean dilutes the waste they produce, which allows nature to take care of it more efficiently. Aquaculture has expanded because it is highly efficient, requires only small areas of water, and requires little fuel. However, it can contaminate wastewater, and fish that escape may compete or breed with wild fish. The density of fish in aquaculture can lead to increases in disease instances, which can be transmitted to wild fish. Fish are great too, because they require less food in order to raise them, especially compared to cows. Switching our diets to more efficient foods, forms of meat like fish and chicken, would go a long way towards food security and sustainability, as they require less inputs in order to produce the same amount of food energy. And last up is sustainable agriculture. I shy away from the word organic agriculture because that's not the end all be all of food production. I'll say it again. If you're a farmer or rancher, every time I say the blessing is at my table, I include you in that prayer. The end result, unless, you, unless we want it to be the end of agriculture, is to find ways to support tasty food in sustainable ways forever. And that's it for this screencast. Thanks for watching.